I don't really wake up in the morning until I hear the words 784 Four Hotel Hotel. There's a silence, and out of nowhere, the words echo. I'm in my flight suit, flight helmet on, listening to the radio communications between the helicopter and dispatch. We're telling them that we are setting off for the morning to survey the sparrows. As we take off, a blast of cold air comes zipping past the helicopter because we fly without doors on the helicopter. I think it's that that really wakes me up. As we head out over the, the landscape, the sun is not yet up, and there's a thin veil of mist and often I find myself standing above the mist. The mist is two or three feet high, and I'm above the mist. And I'm looking across this misted landscape and listening. We survey about 600 locations across Everglades National Park and Big Cypress National Preserve. And we're listening for the song of the Cape Sable Sparrow, which is sort of an obscure little buzz. And by surveying the bird across its entire range, including places where it doesn't occur, um, we get a, a yearly estimate of how many birds they are and over what kind of geographical range they occur. So that when the bad things happen to the birds, habitat, floods, fires, we know the uh, impact of those bad things and we can try and minimize them in future. This sparrow lives only in the Everglades. This is the only place it knows as home. And the Everglades is one of the world's most important wetland ecosystems. It's also very, very fragile. To the east of us, we have Miami and Fort Lauderdale, one of the fastest growing urban areas in our country. Uh, to the north of us, we have um, sugar growers, uh, who want to both um, hang on to the water when they need it for their crops and also put a lot of pollution out when they've, uh, uh, they've done with the water. There are a lot of threats both to the north and to the, uh, to the east of us. It's a matter of getting the water right. The Everglades is a wetland. It depends on water. It depends on getting the right amount of water at the right time of year. What has harmed the Cape Sable Sparrow um, is that the water managers prefer to, to dump water here in the western parts of the park rather than in the eastern parts of the park which are closer to people. That means that the eastern part of the park is too dry, it burns a lot because people are careless and set fires. And this western part of the park in wet years gets flooded. Um, ten years ago, on this date, we would have been standing three feet in water. The sparrows nest on the ground, uh, the young do not have snorkels, and if you flood the sparrows when they're breeding, they fail. And the numbers came crashing down from over 3,000 birds in this area to now just a couple of hundred. Ten years ago, this entire area was flooded. It was flooded for three years continuously. That flooding not only eliminated 90% of the sparrows in the area, reducing the total population of the birds by about half. Half the birds occur on this side of the slough, half the birds occur on the other side of the slough. It not only reduced the bird population to 10% of what they had been originally, but it completely devastated the vegetation. This beautiful mixed prairie with a lot of different kinds of grasses and, and flowers in it uh, was reduced to very little plant cover and, and only one grass, sawgrass, was able to survive. It completely destroyed the bird's habitat. It's taken a decade to, to recover. The question is, are the birds recovering? Of course, we'd like to know a lot more about the birds, and for that we have intensive study sites across the birds' entire range, where we send out teams to ban the birds, to put uh, metal bands and color bands on the birds. How do we catch them? 
we have what's called a mist net, a very fine, soft net that's so fine that the birds can't see it. Uh, we're really rather mean to the birds. We play a tape recording of the bird's song, so a male uh, feels that somebody is intruding in his territory, trying to steal its home. The males get very angry. They fly at the song of this intruding bird, which is really our tape recorder. And between the bird and the tape recorder, we have a net. When we catch the bird, we take it out very quickly. We weigh it, measure it, put an aluminium band on its leg with a number that is unique to that bird. But we also put color bands on the birds, which is also a, a unique identifier. And those color bands allow us to see that bird, identify that bird in the field without capturing it, usually through a telescope. Um, and then we can know which bird survived from one year to the next. And if a bird decides to, to go on an adventure and fly to another part of its range, we can detect it there. So the banding tells us about how well the birds survive, uh, where they are, and how they disperse. The sun comes up, the colors are spectacular, and I just then hear a sparrow. Bzzz. And that tells me that species survives, and it's surviving in one of the most extraordinary wildernesses that we have in the United States. I'm hugely privileged to be part of the effort to save the Everglades, but I'm also hugely privileged to watch the sun rise from a helicopter for two months of the year in April and May. Thank you.